for the Philippine government, particularly in agriculture policy. He has authored numerous published research papers and co-edited four books on the economics of agriculture and natural resources, rural development, food security, international trade, and the microeconomy. He has also provided technical assistance to government agencies in Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam, and various Asian bodies while consulting for international donor agencies. Previously, he was assistant professor at Ateneo de Manila University and University of the Philippines, Los Banos. He obtained his PhD from the University of the Philippines School of Economics in 2000 and did postdoctoral research at the World Fish Center in Penang, Malaysia. In 2017, he was the UP Los Banos College of Economics and Management of Standing Alumnus for Economics and Public Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, our fourth speaker is Dr. Rolando Briones. Good afternoon, thank you. So please show my slides. All right, so it's agro-industrial time. This is the fourth industrial revolution. Why are we talking about agriculture? I think it's already been mentioned by the other speakers. It's still very important. Next slide. Uh, especially if you want a growth, well, we are proud of our growth, 6 7%, but is it inclusive? Unless it reaches agricultural workers, which account for 62.4% of the working poor, it's not going to be very inclusive. Where are these workers? Uh, a lot of them are, in, in, uh, are just regular farm workers. Oh, sorry, I just farm workers not working on their own farms. Some of them are in rice, a bit more are in corn, some are in coconut, and a big share of them are underemployed. So this is one big problem in the labor market, especially in agriculture. Now here is a complicated table uh, where I try to sort out the various regions of the Philippines in terms of whether the economy is primarily agricultural, industrial, or services based. Then there's a hybrid category called agro-industrial. Who is services space? Turns out, based on the criteria, only one. It's national capital region. 80% of employment and 83% of GDP produced in services. What are the agricultural uh, regions? It's uh, Cagayan Valley, it's Mimaropa, it's Bicol region, it's uh, Caraga, down there, Taba, which, yeah, region 13, and then ARMM are still regarded by this schema as uh, ag uh, agricultural. Most of the regions in Mindanao fall under the hybrid ag agro-industrial. Uh, malaki yung share ng agri sa GDP and employment, pero malaki din yung share ng industry. So, hybrid siya, next. Unfortunately, even though our regional economies, many of them, especially in Mindanao, are dependent on agriculture. Agriculture is the lagging sector. You know that we have growth of 6 7%, when the reality is mostly from industry and services. Kulela to agriculture, it's difficult to deny the reality. Uh, in 2016, that contract by instead of growing. So had that sector just stayed stable, our GDP might have grown a little bit faster. Then it was in 2017, but that's because it recovered from an El Nino. So that's another uh, key factor about the agricultural sector. It's so prone to risk because of climate change. Next. In terms of export performance then, the lang sa growth, our ability to sell agricultural products to other countries, mahina if we benchmark it against other ASEAN uh, neighbors. Uh, even we started at a low base, dapat makahabol sana tayo, but hindi. From 1995, ang halos kagape lang natin is Vietnam in terms of agricultural exports. By 2016, triple na ang agricultural exports ng Vietnam. Let alone the Thailands, the Indonesias, uh, where their agricultural exports are hitting 40, uh, 40 billion dollars a year or more. Next. So, we need an industrial strategy 
apply it to agriculture. Now, this is not your traditional industrial policy. It's stated here in the 15 development plan, there should be a national industrial strategy aimed at the grain industry, particularly manufacturing, agriculture, and services, while strengthening their linkages to domestic and global value chains. Uh, in the traditional industrial strategy, we're fond of picking winners. You might remember during the martial law period, uh, nationwide, we had 11 big industries, 11 industrial projects, right? Steel, uh, petrochemicals, and so on. The new industrial strategy does not have that orientation. Whereas the traditional industrial strategy tried to protect domestic markets, okay, so it's called an import substitution thrust. And then it's really planned from, or do you want to begin adding protections and incentives to these selected industries? Sana what is it in the world market? Pero hindi nangyarito. So we have abandoned that. Now we have an industrial strategy based on a level playing field. We actually try to diagnose problems. What are the key binding constraints? A regulatory burdens, coordination problems. Then we ask the stakeholders in these various um, in industries or sectors to come up with their own roadmaps to address these constraints and be able to achieve a development goals. So this is called participatory uh, planning. And the, the output is the roadmap. So it's more of a bottom-up approach and government will be part of it, maybe convene, uh, convene it or support it, but actually the drivers of the process should be the industry players themselves, including the workers, the entrepreneurs and so on, next. So, we have to, given this perspective of value chains, we cannot just look at agriculture by itself, otherwise it'll just fail, okay? We should also look at the sectors drawing from agriculture, the forward linkages, and the sectors that agriculture is drawing from, the backward linkages, such as fertilizers, uh, chemicals, seed industry, so within developing Asia, if you look at the trend of agricultural growth, it was always accompanied by development of the associated value chains. This is called the agribusiness transition. So just staples, staples, cereal, feed your population. Hindi na dapat, dapat mag-diversify, dapat mag-commercialize. So if you look at the shares of agribusiness, agriculture plus mixed services in GDP, ang malaki ng shares in Indonesia sa Thailand, 33-43%. Sa Pilipinas, it's just over 10 20%, the 10% the of agri and then 11% for the linked sectors. So, para ma develop yung agriculture, usually the orientation is, oh, taasan natin yield ng rice, taasan, kailangan niya, no? But equally important is to develop the associated value chain, the post-harvest facilities, the storage facilities in the case of, say, onion, and so on. And then to, not to automatically assume that we need to produce everything, domestically, but actually to exploit value chains. I think Mindanao learned this lesson very well. Instead of insisting on, okay, we have to reserve all production here in Mindanao, uh, staple feed our Mindanao people, you went the ascenso way, right? If you can just sell to the world market and earn foreign exchange, and then you can buy the stuff you need. Yet a key to agribusiness development. So the idea is, from the comprehensive national industrial strategy, move on to um, uh, local uh, agriculture in, in relation to agribusiness. So this was a, this study was the output of several past exercises. Now, uh, so look at some promising industries, mango, karakinan, seaweed, cacao, next slide. And here are some of the uh, price, uh, proxy for price. You, mango doesn't seem, uh, sorry, karagilan doesn't seem to be uh, going up uh, because of production issues, but there's now global glut. But if you look at from 2017 onwards, uh, sorry, 2011 onwards, coca bean prices and uh, mango, mango in that group category still have some favorable outlook in terms of uh, global market opportunities. One region that really took this roadmap to heart, although they may use some other terminology, is the Davao region. So there's the Davao region industry cluster roadmaps. 
And if you look at the industry clusters, there's a mining there, there's a renewable energy, but this tends, there's an ICT even there, but look, it's dominated by agribusiness clusters. So they have identified the land, 15 challenges. This is downloadable if you want to see uh, what they have developed next. So some of these, in these um, exercises, Template that they will start with the situation of their industry. I have attempted to try to synthesize the major insights. There's a big issue with supply chains. Small farmers do not have the access to the technologies, the technical knowledge, the quality inputs, like planting materials. There are also horizontal type um, uh, constraints, such as inadequate investment from the public sector on uh, public goods, especially research and development, development of uh, key varieties. Uh, that, that will enable farmers to supply to these global supply chains. There's a big infrastructure uh, backlog in terms of farm to market roads, irrigation facilities, and so forth. Next. There is a weak regulatory and certification system. One example is lack of standards on rubber grades. We produce a lot of rubber, then we export. But then we have rubber manufacturing that imports a lot of its uh, uh, rubber, raw rubber requirements because the quality standards are very different. The standard that they need to be able to produce their tennis balls is not what our producers are able to supply. Similarly, there are issues with shrink in terms of bio, uh, biosecurity procedures and the ability to impose these on the, our shrimp hatcheries. Um, cacao processors need to comply with international standards like good manufacturing practices, but this might somehow require the purchase of certain machines and technologies that they cannot afford. So, kailangan at least in the beginning support for MSMEs, probably from the public sector, or perhaps from big brother partners in the industry itself. Next. There's a problem in our countryside with property rights, very weakly protected. I think I don't need to belabor this point in Mindanao. Anytime you have a big project in, in rural areas, you know what I mean, right? So, it's better if your property rights to your machineries, to your land, could be protected. But in the absence of this, it's very difficult to invest. Even everywhere, no, not just Mindanao, but even in Luzon, there's a problem always in securing a clean title to a relatively large, contiguous piece of property. And that's really cumbersome for agricultural or agribusiness investment. The industry players keep on pointing out to car because that's actually one source of a regulatory burden. Say, um, if, if you want to consolidate lands, then there's always that issue of is it still compliant with the rare report? Next. So, in a, so, to address these constraints, a lot of measures have been recommended. Basically, it's like flipping things around and addressing these constraints one by one. So I think I can just leave you with this idea. Next. So again, next. It's just um, several. Um, I think we can just skip straight to the last slide. Oops. No, yes. So the takeaway is, the development of the rural economy is still key to inclusive growth. And agricultural development is not just limited to the farm that involves the transition to agri-based business. And this rural transformation entails upgrading and restructuring of value chains. So hindi lang yung industry na upgrade na nag-innovate, pati yung agro-industry towards high-value agro-industrial products. So we hear Belgian chocolate, Swiss chocolate, those countries don't produce cocoa beans. That's imported from Africa. But you don't hear about Ghana or Ivory Coast chocolate, sad to say, no? But maybe we can hear a Filipino chocolate story. <laughs> and this modernization needs to be propelled by a participatory process, organized around road mapping exercises. But in the end, this output, this road map is simply a venue for us to get around, seriously discuss with the key stakeholders, including government, what are their key problems and what measures can each player take to be able to resolve those problems and achieve the goals of development? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pionis, for that very nice presentation. At this point, I would like to give you the microphone, I mean, I would like to give you, rather, the moderator of this open forum, but in the meantime, let me remind everybody that please you have to write your questions in a piece of paper and then Ms. Dillon and Sheila will collect them. I understand the papers are already with these two ladies. 
ready to be read by the moderator. Dr. Campaner, please. Before we read and entertain the possible questions coming from the participants, may I request that three discussions to prepare. Uh, of course, we have uh, Dr. Maria Marieta Sobagaisai, the Executive Director of the National Research Council of the Philippines. And next to her is Engineer Johannes Armando Pasqua, the Professor of the College of Engineering and Architecture of UST. Um, I request the two discussions to please occupy the seats. Ama yung uh, hapon sa tanan. Uh, thank you to our speakers for the insightful presentations. I will not repeat what they said. They said it best. Uh, I will just focus my short talk on one lens which must be taken when we talk about fire. What it means to be a woman in the age of fire. So this is about SDG number five. The fourth industrial revolution introduces processes and procedures where blockchain the Internet of Things, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, supercomputing, holograms, cryptographs, robots, genome editing, and various forms of automation become embedded in societies and even inside human bodies. It is a revolution uh, that will change the way we live, work, and relate with one another. We ask how, but there is more to the hows. It is important to recognize who are at highest risk with automation which jobs are most likely to be lost and destroyed, and how fast will these jobs be lost and destroyed? Who will be the bigger loser when the cyberspace becomes the fourth avenue of engagement and decision making next to land, water, and air? Is it the men, the women? Let's not forget, the technology must work for both women and men. There are indications that point to the high probability of the rise in the feminization of poverty due to fire. Uh, the greater gap may widen, nobody can tell today. Nevertheless, the preparation of safety nets, particularly for women who will lose jobs due to disruptive technologies, must ensure this divergence in men's and women's role in the future. There, this must necessarily be research and evidence based and not products of anecdotes. This underscores the importance of collecting sex disaggregated data and analyzing the differential situation of men and women through a gender lens. Of course, you know that the Philippines is the most gender equal nation in Asia. If you are a woman and you are a loan officer or a receptionist, an information officer, a legal assistant or a retail salesperson, then you are in a job which is identified in the top five jobs most immediately at risk of automation. The Malaysian Foresight Institute adds travel agents, journalists, and bank tellers. These are female-dominated jobs, and corollary to this, this gender, there are gender studies which reveal that these tasks are generally extensions of homework for which women have been best prepared by home and society. That is, receiving visitors, recording, budgeting, negotiating. If you are a woman and your job is in the value chain node of input provision, processing, and trading, then you are most likely to lose your job due to automation. Tasks in these value chain nodes may be in fishing, farming, manufacturing, or service sector are mostly performed by women. Uh, accessing credit, marketing, peddling, cooking, food preservation, packing, cleaning, washing, labeling, record keeping, and budgeting are traditionally female tasks. If you are a woman and you are engaged in jobs that do not require highly cyber skills or in jobs that can easily be digitized, 
such as in call centers and service industries, then you can easily be replaced by robots and chatbots. In 10 years, it is expected that 60% of jobs will be completely new. Goodbye to traditional career models. Welcome to the bloggers, apps developers, and data scientists. So how do we craft policies for the management of the transition to fire such that fire does not drive further gender inequality? Do we expect greater promise for inclusive growth or do we become hostage of a technological disruption? Do we expect a rising trend of what UN's observation in 2013 was where more people in the world own a mobile phone than people who have access to basic sanitation. In the age of fire, women's roles will be in jobs that machines cannot fill up and jobs that require the maternal and nurturance nature of women, such as those that require empathy and compassion. Uh, that's from the World Economic Forum. There must be a continuous up-training and upskilling of women workers' competencies in order to supply jobs that have yet to be created within the cyber system platform. Automation will surely transform lives of men and women, hence a call to reinvent male and female future jobs. After all, who can exactly tell today the future impact of fire? The fourth industrial revolution might even prove to have positive impact on women. Nothing so far, nothing can say whether it's uh, the feminization of poverty that will really happen in the future. Uh, we need enablers to address gender discrimination and gender equality issues as we will start to move towards STEM courses and courses that will require creativity and skills that, require, that are required in negotiating in coordination, people management, and emotional intelligence. So the bottom line, what I want to say is, I am calling for a gender lens in fire, such that no woman is left out from the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Today's generation doesn't have that. 
That's why we have a proliferation of fake news in the internet. But baby boomers, those who live in the older generation, they really have that ability to filter out facts from that facts. But for me, I'm in the middle. Because I was born in the 1970s, maybe in the third industrial revolution. We don't have the internet at that time. So I have a taste of getting information uh, similar to the big moments. But also, on the advent of the 90s, we witnessed also that. So we have been exposed to industrial 4.0, Facebook, social media, and everything. So we consider ourselves to be lucky because we have the two qualities. We have the ability to filter out information patients. And also we have the, we adopted the dynamism of the millennials. The good thing about the millennials is they have this luxury of having everything, the digital age. But also they also absorb the noise that we have. So as an educator, we really need to harness these two criteria, so these two uh, qualities, in order as for us to actually the fourth industrial revolution, which is in this information. It has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. Actually, the, I'm doing research right now on how to correlate digitization to efficiency. And I'm going to leave you with this picture. This is actually the picture of our Google market here in Thailand, the world, the night market. So this was taken last Monday night. And when you go to the Google market, these are the people who are actually the value and chain of our agriculture. So this is actually the last mile where in they sell their products. Of course, some products go to the export market, but of course, if you go to these realities, they have these producers. And what we see, what we see is, those people are doing the traditional method of merchandise. And I would say, can we use Industry 4.0 digitization to improve how these people do their business? And the question is, I always have a question that all of these tomatoes and everything, by the middle of the night, maybe by midnight, at the peak of luck, it might be, for example, for carrots, it might be 80 per kilo. But at the middle of the night, on one o'clock, it would be 30 pesos per kilo and that, or 5 pesos per kilo and that. Because, by the end of the day, but in the morning, of course, we don't have value yet. So what usually ends up with this produce are the sad fat on the right. They become garbage. And if you look at the garbage aspects, those rotten tomatoes, those rotten melons, those rotten vegetables, they did require energy to be produced, they did require energy to be transported, and they contributed to the carbon footprint in our environment. And it's quite sad. Now, if we could reduce the waste, I think we also could reduce the energy that we need to use to produce these goods in the first place. And based on my study, Industry 4.0 can actually reverse this. So I'm doing research on how do does digitization improve efficiency on the way we do it. For example, energy usage, the way we do business. In other words, how can digitization improve the way we use energy, improve our productivity, improve our climate change mitigation and also eventually reduce waste. And I think digitization, Industry 4.0, offers us with a very good opportunity. If we could connect these two, I think we can solve a lot of problems because everything is connected. This waste can be traced down to every aspect of the agriculture production, even agribusiness, even energy generation. I used to believe that we don't lack energy. We only have, we consider that we lack energy because we need to produce this much to supply the energy usage. But if you look at the efficiencies, 
is when you have 30 percent wastage in terms of energy. So if we could reduce this, we have a better, in other words, we don't need to produce this much energy because we don't waste this amount of energy. And that is where digitization could solve that. And that way, we solve our energy problem. And also, a point in my presentation is, I would like to share the distributed future. Industry 4.0 is the driver for the distributed future. What is distributed future? Technology is then, it's enabling each and every one of us. The power of digital performance there, or the power of industry performance there, is that every people here is actually empowered to change the world. Everyone here has Facebook around, everyone here has uh, a smartphone. And if you notice, the future is actually not centralized, but distributed. Because people can do more today. If you look at the internet, you can actually create your own website, you can create your own firm, you can, for example, this. You can even broadcast information. You are not no longer hindered by traditional uh, disadvantages. As long as you have a connection to the internet, you can actually do anything that you want. So people today are actually empowered. Technologies like blockchain, 3D printing, open source, the open source movement, they are enabling each and every one to build faster and challenging grow in the to build up an enterprise. And also the driver of industry 4.0 is not the big companies but it's actually the smaller companies. It is the innovators that will drive it. As one quote says, the author, uh, Winston Domarillo, in his book, ready or not, the six big disruptions that will change the way we do business, he says that the future is controlled by the innovators, not by the big companies. Because he said, for example, in PLDT, when he was there as a consultant. During in this, in this, in this revolution, if we take five of our engineers in PLDT to do innovative products, they will be left behind. If we support five guys coming out of PLDT, young guys were able to train sleepless nights with innovating something. The startups, they are much faster to produce something compared to our five engineers in PLD. So large companies usually get those people which are innovators. And the companies, or companies find it difficult to adjust because you need to change a lot of infrastructure. But here comes our startups, here comes our younger generations, composed of five guys. They can do something in one way, which is very, very critical. Large companies today are building on that. They no longer, in other words, they no longer thrive on creating their own values or their own products, but they hire new innovators. Look at Google. They buy a broke Android. Look at Microsoft. They are willing to get GitHub and they own it because they have seen the value that to embrace industry for next era, you need to embrace innovators. And innovators are not found in large companies. They are found everywhere because of industry for next era. So our university is actually doing that. We are harnessing individuals or we are training our individuals, our students, to become innovators not just users of technology, but eventually creators of technology. Everything can be learned on the internet. You don't need to go to school to learn everything. But of course, you need the core subjects. The basic literal, the basic uh, requirements like mathematics. But everything else can be found on the internet. It's just a series of finding it in your head. So the key for our educators is Let's develop students which are innovators. The one who loves to create new things and the one who loves 
and are excited when they created new things. So I hope Digital Pharma is a role will aid us in the new future where we can solve the inefficiencies and we empower each and every one. So I leave this with this question to our speakers. How do you think? How can we make digitization improve our efficiency in the use of energy in the shortening of our ways and also on how we do our lives? Okay, and that's all. Thank you very much. Hey, how uh, uh, let's give a round of applause to our two discussants, Dr. Sumagaisai and uh, Engineer Pasquot. And for the questions, I think you have already formulated and have that written in the piece of paper. Uh, we promise to have that answered by the speakers this afternoon. For the meantime, I will turn over the uh, microphone to our uh, Master of Ceremonies. Thank you, sir. Time check, ladies and gentlemen, is five minutes past one o'clock. So we are behind schedule. Anyway, we are still alive up to this point. Shall we give ourselves a round of applause, please? Just a piece of reminder, at this time, we would like to request the panelists of the press conference, Dr. Celia Reyes, Dr. Rosalito Quirino, Dr. Ramon Razal, Director Rizal D. Tan, and Dr. Ambrosio Cultura II to proceed to the University Boardroom for the press conference with the local media. And then we'll take our lunch and then let's get back to this venue at exactly 1.30. Okay? Thank you so much. By the way, the buffet will be served at the fifth floor of this engineering complex. So the rest of the guests may proceed to the fifth floor. The, the VIPs for the press con will proceed to the boardroom. It's a working press conference. Usher. Not ushers. Also, the speakers of the three sessions are invited to proceed to the university boardroom. I repeat the speakers.